Okay. Well, so welcome everyone to uh, this week's Durham Geometry and Topology Seminar. So it's a, it's a pleasure to uh, have uh, Jeff Carlson from Imperial College, and he's going to talk about the cohomology of Gelfin uh, sideline fibers. So thank you, Jeff. Please. Uh, well, thank you, Ramona, for inviting me and uh, the audience for coming. All right. Um, so this is, uh, yes, thank, thank the host. Um, done that. I don't remember what the excuses were. I had something, um, there's something about fonts, but uh, we'll see if there are graver excuses I meant to apologize for. So this started um, when uh, Jeremy Lane, who was at University of Toronto at the same time as me, asked me a question about these because I think he saw me give a talk about homogeneous spaces or fiber bundles and thought I would be a person to deal with this problem. I didn't know what he was um, talking about at first, uh, like the definitions, and then over the course of, uh, he asked me this like three times, three separate years, and I didn't think I could do anything with it at first. And then I realized that it was uh, <laughs> accessible. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is a joint work in progress. And um, yeah, what will happen today? Uh, so I'm going to talk about motivation. Some is very classical from representation theory, and there's a connection with physics, which um, I'll repeat words about, essentially. I will not be able to respond meaningfully if pressed about that, but it seems, I asked Jeremy, why did people start to care about this? And um, I'm able to relay something, if not to like informally speak about it. And right, I'm going to yeah, say something about the symplectic Motivation again. This is, uh, yeah, a <laughs> my rendition, and I'm going to talk about the objects and the cohomology, and say something about the proof, um, depending on timing. Right. So, uh, the representation theoretic motivation is that uh, representations of the unitary group irreducible ones are described by a highest weight vector. Um, and these correspond to irreducible representations. You can ask what happens if you restrict to a block diagonal subgroup. So this direct sum means a block diagonal sum. It makes sense if you think about um, sums of Hom groups, um, but I think of this as terms of matrices and it's just more explicit than a cross somehow for me. Uh, so if you restrict one of these irreducible representations, um, then you get a direct sum of other irreducible representations where the weights of the sum ends uh, satisfy their eigenvalues or weights satisfy these equalities. Um, so they're called interlacing. And Gelfand and Zetlin, so this is like the 30s maybe, and then Gelfand and Zetlin, Zetlin, um, around 1950 or so, uh, noted that if you keep this restriction, um, then you get an inequality triangle rather than triangle inequality. And when you reduce um, restrict rather to this uh, first U1, then it decomposes in um, this nice way. And you have these sort of joint eigenspaces that have, um, yeah, that have all of the properties at once. Um, so another thing you can do is you can just take these lambdas that were before uh, integers to be naturals, to be reals. Um, and you can define a polytope that way that's given by these um, inequalities. So each, each inequality cuts off a half space and then you get um, some nice shape, uh, which pretty much just has a combinatorial description. Um, so in this definition uh, for this polytope, the first row is fixed, but the other row, subsidiary rows are any values satisfying these triangular identities, not identities, inequalities. Yeah, so we're allowing real values now. And uh, there's going to be a reason for this. And so here's a picture this, you stop being able to draw these, but here's what one looks like. And you can already see that the particular values of lambda here, um, or lambda three, uh, don't figure directly in the geometric type of the shape up to scaling, right? So the integral points of this described flags that were, gave these uh, representations before this decomposition. And this decomposition, this allows you to determine multiplicities of irreducible representations and tensor products, because um, the multiplicity of one of these is given by the number of interlacing triangles of the given second row. And uh, this came up in quantization as well. 
And I'll say something about that. Right. And here's proof that other people have thought about um, such things. This is from 2009, so not so long ago, in an article I don't fully understand. And so symplectic motivation is there's a form of geometric quantization known as bohr sommerfeld quantization um, that applies to symplectic manifold equipped with a sort of generalized moment map. And the fibers are compact connected Lagrangian manifolds. And there's a Hilbert space of phases where it's, this is where I start to just be um, repeating words. Um, and most of the data associated with this arises um, from specific um, yeah, specific points in the base. Um, so this sort of it's local information style. This is a form of quantization. And the action coordinates are something that comes from symplectic uh, geometry generally. And the fibers in this, this are all n tori. And right, somehow the information is all uh, concentrated at these in the integral points of B with respect to these action coordinates. Uh, so Gilman and Sternberg uh, noted 80s that um, you can associate interlacing triangle to the orbit of the coadjoint action, orbits of the coadjoint action of UN on Hermitian matrices with given eigenvalues. This is really skew Hermitian, but um, dividing by I gives Hermitian and their and real eigenvalues, and that's easier to deal with. So we'll just make that identification from now on. And so there's a this uh, orbit map. Gives, has the base space, the gelfand zetlin polytope, and the fibers over the integer lattice in the gelfand zetlin polytope are orbits passing through the integer lattice in the dual algebra. Um, yeah, and the quantization, the information is somehow concentrated in the one-dimensional subspaces of this canonical decomposition. And this is somehow more general than the uh, previous setup that the fibers are still uh, Lagrangian tori generically, but um, not all of them actually are in this case. And um, somehow the same quantization result seems to hold, though the setup is different. So this is sort of an edge case between known well-behaved realms and something different, which is I think one of the reasons it's received interest from real symplectic geometers. Um, yeah, and there are non-degenerate singularities where there's still something you can say, and this, um, the Gulf and Zetlin fibers don't quite satisfy that either. So um, there's something that remains to be explained, and I'm not the person to explain this, but I will talk about the topology of the fibers a bit. All right, so yeah, that was big picture, smaller picture. Um, we're going to write Hermitian matrices as HK, identify them with the co-joint representation, and the orbits are the fibers of the map that takes X to its list of eigenvalues. And the restriction to this, uh, I said I meant upper left, not lower right, uh, subgroup preserves the co-joint orbits and the projection where you lop off the end of a matrix is equivariant with respect to this subgroup. So if you write um, lambda upper parentheses k minus one for the vector of eigenvalues of this truncation, it satisfies these interlacing inequalities. And if you keep going, you get, um, keep lopping off, you get um, more eigenvalues um, satisfying these triangles. And although these are reals now rather than integers, yeah, we have this triangle, which I have redrawn. And uh, the topology of the fiber, it should be noted, doesn't really change if you change the lambdas a little. It changes if an inequality becomes an inequality or vice versa, which corresponds to passing to a face in the polytope, the base polytope. And so the values don't specifically matter for the topology, which is what we're, or even the geometry, which is what I'm interested in. So I'm going to label them by integers, but if three became pi or something, it wouldn't be an issue. So the relation information is really um, concentrated um, in a picture like this that has, this is the inequalities as before, but I've drawn a line whenever there's an equality and just don't draw a line when there's a strict inequality. And that really contains, um, somehow that prescribes all the information already, this sort of combinatorial picture. All right, and I've commented that the specific uh, real values don't matter for the topology or yeah, even the diffeomorphism type. Um, 
Right. So here's an example of two rows of such a triangle. This could come up. Um, it does for, um, yeah. So here's lambda upper eight and here's lambda upper seven. This is such a picture. Um, generally, if I fix some picture, then the what we're calling the gelfin setland fiber, the fiber of the map to the polytope, it can be seen as the smallest term like there's a sequence of inclusions where you impose more of these restrictions, the truncations need to have eigenvalues, the lambda upper k minus one, upper k minus two, et cetera. So um, these spaces here are the subset of formation matrices whose uh, truncations have the prescribed eigenvalues. Uh, so just the, the orbit of the lambda uh, k under the co-adjoint orbit is just um, this row. And then if you have things satisfying both their um, prescribed eigenvalues, both these two rows, you get um, this FK, K minus one, you keep going. And then the thing we're interested at the end, in at the end is the one where all of the truncations have the prescribed eigenvalues. So you go further and further back under these inclusions. Uh, so lopping off this uh, operation phi, if you have something that satisfies uh, the appropriate prescription, then um, by definition, it's uh, in this next fiber, which I'm um, saying these allowed might be less useful than just uh, letting the notation carry it. And what this means is that the phi gives a sequence of projections onto subspaces. And so there's this big picture. Here's the original space and then if you go further back, um, these intersections, then phi um, restricts nicely. And the, you can think of this as a pullback diagram, actually. So this FK is um, this pullback of this map, but it's also iterated pullback of these restrictions. So now here comes a, yeah, here comes a larger diagram uh, where you keep doing this. And so this FK is sort of an iterated pullback of these where these horizontal maps here are in turn pullbacks along these and you keep going. And so you have all of these pullback squares. And so this gives you a hope of understanding this fiber just in terms of these inclusion maps and these projections, big phi. Yeah, so, but um, just writing this as inclusions isn't helpful. What will be helpful is to find expressions for these in terms of homogeneous spaces. So each element um, of this FL L minus one, meaning X and phi of X, the truncation have prescribed eigenvalues, um, can be thought of in terms uh, as a single orbit, as it turns out. So because ULX transitively on the co-adjoint orbit by definition, we can think of um, that as a homogeneous space, UL mod stabilizer, by orbit stabilizer theorem. And so we can identify in this picture, which is the um, right edge, part of the right edge of that big um, scary pullback diagram, um, we can identify two of these spaces. And um, it would be helpful to identify this guy as well, so I can think of phi as a map of homogeneous spaces. Yeah, so this is this uh, right-hand part here in this diagram, this picture. I just want to identify this locally in terms of spaces that are more familiar and homogeneous spaces are about as good as you get. So it's a theorem that um, this FL L minus one is also a homogeneous space. So it can be identified with the homogeneous space where um, the subgroup is this guy. Can think of it in terms as a subgroup of UL or of UL minus one. And evidently, because this uh, projection, this truncation operation is equivariant, it's a um, subgroup of the stabilizer of the truncation of some kind. So that gives the map of homogeneous spaces. And then, if I want to be more specific about um, what that is, I which I will in a few slides, we'll look at representatives. We'll sort of normalize our representative for phi x will be a block that will be a diagonal matrix whose entries are just um, these lambda upper L minus one values, this list. So if we take some uh, element whose truncation is of this form, 
then the stabilizer is block diagonal determined by the numbers of lambdas, which are the same, right? And I also, yes, yeah, so I've just moved this to the top of the slide. And then I wanna understand this uh, smaller subgroup, this stabilizer. And if I write, if the truncation of X is of this form, then X has to be of this form for some complex numbers, Z and Z, sorry, in the UK now, and C. Uh, so to determine this stabilizer, I'm going to write this. And then it turns out, yeah, so the block diagonal structure of the stabilizer phi of x is visible in terms of these blocks of mu's. Are, the mu's are just a link listing of the distinct um, lambda upper or minus ones. And then um, it's not hard to see that if you look at this u l minus one, then it acts on this last column through the standard action of unitary bullet groups on complex vector spaces. So because the, that's transitive on each sphere of fixed radius, right? Um, each sphere in the complex space is, is um, taken, yeah, has a transitive action by the unitary group under the standard action. For a representative of X, we could actually take um, these um, vectors Z to just be all zero coordinates and then one real, one positive real, even if you want. Uh, so we could take representatives like that um, and then, oh no, oh God, why has it done this? Um, so what this says in the area that's cut off that didn't show up when I compiled before somehow is that the corresponding block of the subgroup is the same block if RJ is zero and otherwise it's U DJ minus one or rank one less. Oh, there we go. Right. So here's the new matrix simplified version of X and otherwise the stabilizer, the block of the stabilizer is smaller. And so you can see actually that this um, has to do with the multiplicity of this um, UJ in the um, lambda upper L, um, the eigenvalues of X. It's going to be DJ again, if RJ is zero and otherwise DJ minus one. And so that will show up in this uh, interlacing diagram picture. So for our earlier example, which is going to recur, um, the stabilizer for phi of x is going to be u1, 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 and then two u2 blocks. And the stabilizer, although we're not dealing with H8, just for practice, the stabilizer of the diagonal matrix with um, entries, the list lambda upper eight is going to be u2, then u1, then u2 again, then u1, then u1, then u1. And then this L7 is given um, in term, you can understand this in terms of the picture um, because it's going to be u1 when there are enough of the same eigenvalue above. So you, the same one when there's the same above. So this um, u1 block again, u1, and then it's going to be u0 here because there is no, I4 doesn't occur as an eigenvalue above, its multiplicity goes down. And then the U2 for the threes is gonna be the same again. Then two doesn't figure because it's not an eigenvalue below. And then this U2 block below, you're only going to get, because there's only a corresponding to the eigenvalue one, there's only one, uh, sorry, the one only occurs to the multiplicity one above. So the block corresponding block is going to be just a U1 in this U2. So that's how you get, you can so you can read the L7 as a subgroup of H7 off of this picture. So it admits the description just in terms of the interlacing pattern. Um, so we're gonna have names for these. So the components labeled four and one are M shapes. And these were places where the multiplicity went down and hence the blocks got smaller passing from H7 to L7. And then um, these W shapes, so you can also think of them as upper trapezoids with big part above. And the other ones, the parallelograms we'll call N shapes just to keep consistent with the letter naming and uh, right. So this guy is also going to be called an M shape, this lone vertex below, the lone vertex above will be called a W shape. Right, and so in terms of this description, just to uh, 
no surprises. So this is just a known observation um, that, yeah, if you um, write the HL in this block diagonal form, so you've chosen X such that phi of X is diagonal, um, then the subgroup um, is going to be a direct product of block factors. And the block factors will have the same multiplicity if, um, well, have the same size if the multiplicity of the eigenvalue is the same. And if the multiplicity of the eigenvalue goes down, then they'll be of rank one less. All right, so that's, uh, <laughs> this is just with uh, taking seven and eight to be more general. And our pitch just for general diagram, you get this. And so in terms of these groups, we, now we can write the projection as UL minus one. So the orbit space under this small group and then mod down the orbit space under this bigger group. So it's the quotient more out map. And so this is the projection map of a fiber bundle where total space, base and fiber are all homogeneous. And this is something I know how to work with cohomologically. So we're in better shape. Yeah, and the theorem makes clear that the fiber then is a product of spheres where it's UDJ mod UDJ or UDJ mod UDJ minus one. And since the action is homogeneous, that's a sphere corresponding to each J or a point. Uh, so I think I've written that out. Yeah, so these quotients are DJ minus one spheres for M shapes and just points otherwise. So it follows the gelfin zetland fiber from our uh, large diagram before is the fiber of an iterated sphere, or actually the total space, I mean. There's another way of writing it, so it's a fiber of an iterated sphere bundle. Right, um, and so I've written it. So the cohomology of any um, of these homogeneous spaces that are the fibers in this um, iterated fiber decomposition are just by the Kuhnet theorem can be written as tensor products of home homology of spheres. So they're exterior algebras, particularly over Z. And I've just I moved this to the top. And returning to this uh, example, we get, um, I would have been helpful if I'd written H7, L7 before, but you can see from the picture that um, it's only for M shapes that you get um, interesting spheres in the fiber. And here we've gone from one to zero, so that's S1. And when we go from two to one, we get S two times two minus one or S3. So that's what the cohomology of um, that fiber looks like. So returning to this um, big diagram, we understand sort of the cohomology of these fibers here. And it'll be helpful to understand what the horizontal maps are as well. If we can write that in some nice way in terms of homogeneous spaces, then we'll be able to analyze this using uh, sort of classical techniques that I know. And I didn't see how to do this at first, which is why uh, I made Jeremy ask me three times. But uh, yeah, to spoil the surprise a little, it does work out. All right, so it's usually not the case that X is also diagonal. But um, so remember, X was the matrix who, such that phi of X was, was diagonal and we were happy with it. But there's some conjugate that is diagonal because by transitivity of the action a cohedroid orbit, because it is an orbit. Um, so the inclusion can be identified with this map, the, this iterated map of homogeneous spaces. So the first thing I do is I extend the large group and I still have this um, stabilizer, which had this nice block diagonal description. And then I have a diffeomorphism of UL mod the conjugate. Um, just given by conjugating a coset essentially. Um, and then I mod down, I increase the size of the stabilizer group. And so it can be given this description all in all, this map, which appears a little opaque, um, but it is the case that um, this conjugate of the small stabilizer is some subgroup of the block diagonal unitary group. And it's not hard to see that you can pick a um, such that the factors of the small group embed under this as block factors of this HL, which is block diagonal as well. And um, right. So now this, um, the size of the corresponding factor is going to go up if it's an M shape or an N shape in the diagram. And then um, otherwise it's going to, 
or sorry, it's going to be the same if it's an M shape or an N shape, it'll decrease if the part of the diagram is a W shape. So coming back here, um, associated to the six component, we have the L7 is this U1. And because this shape gets bigger, it, in H8, it embeds in a U2 factor. And then for five, it's U1 and U1. Four doesn't figure because it's not an eigenvalue above. And then for three, this is an N shape, uh, same number of eigenvalues. So there's this inclusion. And then for two doesn't figure, and zero doesn't figure. And for one, we had H7 was, uh, had a U2 there. And then L7 was smaller because the value decreased, um, multiplicity decreased, so it was a U1. And then the block inclusion maps that U1 component to that U1 component. Um, so remember that we were interested in the diffeomorphism type really of this iterated pullback, this fiber. And the middle map in this composition was a diffeomorphism. So the diffeomorphism type of the pullback is unaffected by this um, middle map. So if we took A to be the identity, it isn't in the actual description of the GZ fiber, but if we just change the manifold we were talking about by taking A to be the identity, it would not change the diffeomorphism type. So uh, yeah, we can do this and describe, get sort of an algebraic model, or it's still a topological model for the GZ fiber, but it's not, um, <laughs> it's not the same on a point set level at all, but you get a diffeomorphic manifold and we only care about the cohomology anyway. So we can replace the picture earlier with this picture where this edge of orbit spaces is now, oh, I meant to change this one as well, but exercise, figure out what this should be. Um, yeah, so we can write this in this way now where the maps are all sort of nice now. These are block inclusions. Um, so we're in business. So now I'm gonna describe the cohomology of the fiber and the answer is that it turns out to just be the tensor product of all of these cohomologies of these fibers going down. So it's actually the cohomology as, is as if the whole thing were a product of odd dimensional spheres. It's an exterior algebra. And it's not the case that it actually is a product of spheres. You can get the, for example, if you take your eigenvalues all to be zero, you can get a unitary group, I believe but um, the cohomology is that way. And I have enough time, uh, substantial time, I'll be able to say why that is um, at some level of detail. So uh, the proof is an induction on maps of spectral sequences. And so we had this large diagram here, where I've repeated this, so this uh, guy is still unchanged. And the key point is that if you look at um, this sub diagram, so I'm going to take some area, we'll look at the top here, and I'm going to really forget, I'm just going to compose through all of these and all of these so that I, um, to simplify the picture, just looking at this sub part, I can show that these induced maps down here, so from FL to UL minus one, the composed maps mod HL minus one. I can show the mapping cohomology induced by that is zero um, by induction. And there's a further map that's given by these, the characteristic maps of these, um, I can think of these homogeneous quotients um, using the Borel construction as uh, principal UL bundles over um, this classifying space. And so there's, yeah, I guess this is the, um, yeah, the projection in the Borel construction is the way I should think about it actually. Um, so there's this commutative diagram as well. And this is a map of homogeneous bundles whose fi fiber is this homogeneous space HL minus one over L, L minus one, which was just a product of spheres we showed. And since this induces a map of HL minus one bundles and this further map to the sort of universal bundle um, also is a map of HL minus one bundles. There's a map of serospectral sequences and it's, um, I can determine the differentials in this serospectral sequence, the one I'm interested in from this sort of universals one where I happen to know all the differentials already. I mean, Burrell did in 1952. Um, yeah, so all of the 
I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure how much you know about spectral sequences, but I meant to be brief about this. So assuming you do, um, the exterior generators here all transgress in this sparse spectral sequence, which means all of the differentials are zero until you get to the bit cohomology of the base, um, which lies along the um, zero row. And what that means particularly is because this is a map of spectral sequences, these generators all transgress in this spectral sequence as well. But because this composition along the bottom induces zero in cohomology, this implies that the entire spectral sequence collapses. All of these generators, all their differentials are zero up to the last row, up to the last differential. And then this composition being zero shows that that differential vanishes as well. So this, the surf spectral sequence just collapses. And um, so that gives you something additively up to an extension problem. But it turns out that because the fiber is exterior, there's actually not an extension problem. If you just lift an exterior generator, um, and that gives a splitting, essentially because exterior algebras are free objects, roughly, and a bit more honestly, because there's also no two torsion by induction. So the spectral sequence is collapsed, and that's what gives you this exterior decomposition all in all. And so I should say why this map induces zero in cohomology, and that's a separate induction. And the key step of it is um, this diagram chase, where I have this thing here. And also when I go forward from, this is the inclusion that we had this complicated form for that we simplified, um, this commutes. So I really can think totally in terms, and these maps, these chi, because HL is a full rank, this um, classifying map, I called it, um, this chi is for, chi is for characteristic, not classifying. Um, this um, characteristic map uh, or the projection from the Borel construction is surjective. And so really I just need to know what happens in the cohomology of classifying spaces. Um, but this is known. So this bottom composition is trivial because uh, inductively we've shown that JL star is. And because um, these things are, these LL into HL and HL plus one are block inclusions, um, this map is a surjection. And so it follows that this composition is trivial as well because I can go around this way and get zero or go around this way and this was surjective. So we know this is zero as well. And then because this composition is the same as this one, it follows that this composition is zero too. And because finally um, this chi O minus one star is surjective, uh, I didn't write this. That means that this JL plus one star is uh, surjective too. So that finishes the induction. And then I have a bit more time than I thought. But there's a version of this that goes through for SO instead of U as well. So now I have skew symmetric matrices and um, the eigenvalues are pure imaginary. But if I divide by I, I get a list of list lambdas that satisfies interlacing inequalities like before. It's actually a little better because these um, eigenvalues over I, this um, vector of lambdas at each row, each L upper parentheses is um, symmetric under um, sending uh, under plus minus sending uh, lambda i or lambda j let's say because i is here to lam minus lambda j uh, preserves this so this uh, the g the big triangle this uh, interlacing diagram is symmetric and it turns out that the stabilizers are now products of unitary groups um, and I should say so there are subgroups of s o but because these lambdas are plus minus symmetric, it turns out that under the um, standard embedding where you think of a complex one by one complex matrix as a two by two real matrix, um, the stabilizers corresponding to the non-zero eigenvalues of I, the non-zero lambda, turn out to be block unitary groups. And then for zero, um, which is, um, this can be an odd or, an even special orthogonal group. Um, 
you get special orthogonal factors in this block. The quotients are all still products of spheres anyway. So this description sort of miraculously still holds and you have sort of an iterated sphere bundle. And so the theorem also admits an analog, which is a bit tougher to state and the reason why is that um, the sort of the non-zero eigenvalues behave exactly as before. Um, there's, you can actually break up the entire fiber as a direct product by these um, eigenvalues or even the components of this GZ picture. And the ones over I are as um, behave as appears in the previous argument, the unitary factor is the same, the special orthogonal factors are not, and the spectral sequence doesn't always degenerate. It does something close though, like every two steps, consecutive steps um, do, if you block it off so that the fiber is a um, Stiefel manifold, essentially, then you do get um, a sort of, degeneration or collapse, but it's uh, not as good. So I'll just, yeah, I'm speaking. So the theorem then is if I let a special orthogonal pattern be given, so there's this plus minus symmetry in these eigenvalues over I, then the cohomology is a tensor product of an exterior unitary part, um, exterior algebra, whose corresponding cohomology of odd dimensional spheres and a factor that, um, corresponding to the zero eigenvalue, which um, has something to do with the special orthogonal uh, factors in these stabilizers H and L. And so um, the quotient, um, yeah, so this part is as before, and the quotient of this new part um, by torsion, which actually turns out to all be two torsion, is given, um, is still in exterior algebra if I consider these, um, even dimensional spheres to be um, have exterior cohomology. Uh, so if your uh, conventions allow that. And then this didn't, I wanted to pause here. Um, yes, yeah, so the second type of exterior factor comes from uh, Stiefel manifolds, mod torsion. And then if I don't mod out the torsion, I actually get the same real description without any extension problem. So I get that this is a tensor product of cohomology of spheres, which is exterior if you allow the even dimensional exterior generators and the cohomology of this Schiefel manifold, which is like an exterior algebra, but also has one Z2, um, Z mod two factor, Z mod two factor uh, sum and that interacts uh, trivially multiplicatively. Uh, this is only additive. I can get some of the multiplicative structure out here, but um, not all of it, at least not in this way. I'm not sure how to get all of it out. But this at least tells you what the um, additive description is, what the two torsion is, and how the non two torsion behaves. All right. And that's what I wanted to say. So thank you again for your patience with these uh, diagrams and spectral sequences um, and for having me. <laughs>